Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing cardiac arrhythmias. Okay, so we're now going to start discussing the broad classification of arrhythmias into the different types. Okay, so there are lots of different ways of classifying arrhythmias. I think that the most logical one to begin with is the uh, separation of supraventricular arrhythmias from ventricular arrhythmias. So that's where we're going to begin. Then what we'll talk about is bradycardia and tachycardia, which is another way of classifying arrhythmias. Then what we'll talk about is the symptoms of arrhythmias. And then what I'll do is give you an overview as to how we're going to work our way through the different arrhythmias and talk about the different treatments of cardiac arrhythmias. Okay, right. Uh, so, firstly then, let's talk about the difference between a supraventricular arrhythmia and a ventricular arrhythmia. So the two broad categories that is the main way that I'm going to organise our discussion of arrhythmias are into supraventricular and ventricular arrhythmias. Okay, so these names are very logical. A supraventricular arrhythmia is one that results because of a problem that occurs before the ventricles, and a ventricular arrhythmia is one that occurs uh, because of a problem that is within the ventricles. Okay, so, um, we've discussed how an arrhythmia is a problem with the electrical signalling within the heart, which then leads to a problem with the cardiac rhythm. If the problem is a but, well, if the problem is originating within the atrioventricular node or above that, so if the problem is, for instance, in the sinoatrial node, then that would be counted as a supraventricular arrhythmia because it's certainly above the ventricles. So supra just means above, so it's above the ventricles. If the problem with the electrical signaling was occurring in the atria, then that would be counted as a supraventricular um, arrhythmia. Or if the problem is originating in the atrioventricular node or even the bundle of his, okay, so we'll add that one on as well, the bundle of his, then we will still classify it as a supraventricular arrhythmia. And let me explain what all of these arrhythmias have in common. They all have in common the fact that the QRS complex generally looks normal on the ECG of a patient with a supraventricular arrhythmia. So if there's some problem with electrical signal conduction in the sinoatrial node or the atrial or the atrioventricular node or the bundle of His, provided that the signal is still getting down to the ventricles, which it usually is, once it actually gets to the ventricles, once it's actually been unleashed on the ventricles and it's going down the bundle branches, the QRS complex will be normal because ventricular conduction is absolutely fine. Yes, other things may be extremely abnormal in the ECG, but the QRS complex should be normal, is generally normal in a supraventricular arrhythmia. So that's um, one of the features that allows us to um, say whether the arrhythmia is going to be a supraventricular or a ventricular one, looking at the ECG and asking, is the QRS complex normal in morphology? So the QRS is normal if you've got a supraventricular arrhythmia. Whereas in a ventricular arrhythmia, there is some problem that is lower down now, and this is actually going to lead to you having a very abnormal ECG. So either the problem is actually occurring in the bundle branches, so it could be a problem in the right bundle branch or the left bundle branch, or it's actually occurring in the ventricles. Uh, and this will result in an abnormal QRS complex. In particular, you often end up with an extremely broad QRS complex. So the QRS complex usually is very, very narrow in the ECG. So if I get back up my picture here, it's a quite narrow portion of the ECG, and that's because the electrical signal propagates along, across the entire ventricles extremely quickly because uh, of the fact that there is this ventricular conduction system that spreads the uh, electrical signal to all the different portions of the ventricles. Okay, if there is some problem with the electrical conduction system or there's some problem originating in the ventricles which is then driving the ventricular electrical signal, then the propagation of that electrical signal can take much longer and that can result in the EC G's uh, QRS complex being much broader. Okay, so in these ventricular arrhythmias then, the QRS complex is generally abnormal. 
Okay, so this is the broad way in which we are going to categorize arrhythmias into the superventricular arrhythmias and then the ventricular arrhythmias. And in our discussion, where we're going to work through all the different types of arrhythmias, we will start off with the superventricular arrhythmias and then go on to the ventricular arrhythmias. Okay, so this is one broad way of classifying arrhythmias into superventricular and ventricular, and I think it's a very logical way to classify them, where the problem in the electrical signaling is actually occurring. If it's above the ventricles, i.e. the sine atrial node, the atria, the AV node, or the bundle of Hiss, uh, then you end up with a normal QRS complex, because once the electrical signal actually gets to the ventricles, it's normal from then on, okay? And then if it's below that point, if it's actually ventricular, then you end up with a very odd QRS complex usually. So if there's a problem in the right bundle branch, the left bundle branch, or the ventricles that is driving the problem with electrical signaling, then we call it a ventricular arrhythmia, and you're going to uh, end up with an abnormal QRS complex. Okay, uh, so that's the first classification. Now, usually, uh, cardiac arrhythmias are going to lead to uh, a change in the rate at which the heart is actually beating. Okay, uh, and the two options are that the rate in which at which the heart is beating can either go down, or the rate at which the heart is beating can go up. So here is another. Um, broad way that you can classify arrhythmias into tachycardias and bradycardias. So to each arrhythmia usually we can ascribe either the adjective tachycardia or the adjective bradycardia. It's very rare that you'll get a problem with the uh, electrical signaling within the heart and you will remain uh, at a normal heart rate. Okay, so tachycardia then, the definition of tachycardia is that your heart rate is greater than 100 beats per minute. Okay, whereas the definition of bradycardia is that your heart rate is less than 60 beats per minute. And by the way, what this means, uh, when we say beats per minute, you might wonder, does that mean beats of the atria or beats of the ventricles? Now, usually, of course, every beat of the atria has a beat of the ventricles uh, associated with it. Uh, but in cardiac arrhythmias, where things can go horribly wrong, it might end up that we have loads of atrial beats that only a few of them actually have ventricular beats associated with them. So, of course, this refers to beats of the ventricles, okay? Everything, if in doubt, everything's about the ventricles. The ventricles are the important chambers of the heart. They're the ones that, if problems occur there, uh, it's most likely going to lead to death if untreated. Okay, so everything's always in terms of the ventricles. So this means 100 beats of the ventricles per minute, uh, or less than 60 beats of the ventricles per minute. So tachycardia and bradycardia. So to each arrhythmia, we will ascribe this adjective generally. We'll say this results in a tachycardia, or this results in a bradycardia. Okay, now what I want to talk about is what are the actual symptoms then of having tachycardia or bradycardia? Well, often the symptoms actually end up very similar, and the first thing I want to do is explain why that actually is. If you end up with a massive tachycardia, you might think that the problem is going to lead to exactly the opposite symptoms of bradycardia, but actually tachycardia ends up leading to the same problem as bradycardia, which is low cardiac output. Okay, now you might understand very easily, hopefully, why bradycardia is going to lead to low cardiac output. If the heart is, if the ventricles are beating at a low rate, then of course uh, the amount of blood that is being pumped around the body in a minute, the cardiac output is going to fall. That's very logical. But tachycardia, why is that going to lead to low cardiac output? If the heart's beating at a ridiculously fast rate um, every minute, then surely that will lead to a huge cardiac output. But the reality is that when the heart starts beating at a ridiculously fast rate, it contracts uh, and doesn't then properly relax. Okay, it doesn't have time. So normally what happens is, of course, the ventricles contract down, uh, expel their blood into the pulmonary trunk and the aorta, and then they relax back down. And the relaxation is a really important part because, of course, that allows them to refill with blood. If you have a heart rate that's far too high, then what happens is the ventricles will be receiving that stimulation to contract again before they have actually relaxed. So what will just happen is they'll sort of 
oscillate uh, they'll oscillate by a tiny amount, so if I get my picture back up here, instead of actually contracting down and then relaxing back up, instead they'll remain permanently contracted, and they'll just sort of oscillate, vibrate uh, continuously, where they're trying to relax, but then they're being stimulated too early and they're contracting down, so they will end up expelling hardly any blood, uh, because the refill stage is so short that hardly any blood has actually come into the ventricles for them to expel. So indeed, having a ridiculously high heart rate, uh, tachycardia, will also result in a very low cardiac output. Okay, so uh, what I now want to just go over is what are the symptoms of the low cardiac output, which is often the thing that arrhythmia is resulting, whether they are causing bradycardia or tachycardia, low cardiac output is usually the result of an arrhythmia. Okay, so what are the symptoms then of this? Well, of course, if you've got low cardiac output, then you're not going to be getting as much blood to the brain. And when you get too little blood flow to the brain, too little cerebral perfusion, that generally causes dizziness, it generally causes tiredness, uh, it can even cause fainting, and the fancy word for fainting is syncope, uh, and it will, of course, also make you feel breathless. You'll be getting uh, a lot of desire to breathe and you won't be feeling as though it's having any effect. Okay, so I'll just write those things down. So we said dizziness and confusion, uh, also tiredness, chronic lethargy, fatigue. Um, you might also experience fainting and the fancy word for fainting is syncope. And then what else did I say? Ah yes, breathlessness. Uh, so of course if too little blood is getting to your tissues, then too little oxygen will be getting to your tissues, so you'll be feeling a lot of desire to breathe, uh, and you won't be feeling as though it's having much effect. Okay, so breathlessness. So those are the major symptoms of cardiac output, and as I say, for most arrhythmias, whether they're resulting in bradycardia or tachycardia, you'll be getting low cardiac output, and therefore you will be experiencing these symptoms. In addition, let me add on a few symptoms that you will generally feel if you're suffering from tachycardia uh, rather than bradycardia. Okay, so these are the symptoms that you'll be feeling in both because both of them result in uh, low cardiac output, but there are a few additional symptoms that I'll add on to tachycardia. So if you've got a tachycardia arrhythmia, so an arrhythmia that's resulting in tachycardia, uh, generally it will result in palpitations. You'll be able to feel your heart beating. Okay, so you'll get palpitations, and also um, you'll generally get a bit of chest discomfort. So palpitations and a little bit of chest discomfort, potentially even a little bit of chest pain, but generally it's described as chest discomfort rather than uh, chest pain. Okay, so having a tachycardia arrhythmia uh, can result in palpitations and chest discomfort as well, whereas bradycardia tends not to produce that as much. Okay, right, so those are the symptoms that you might expect if you were suffering from the arrhythmia. Right, so now what I want to do is outline the rest of the structure of my video. How am I going to uh, approach the topic of arrhythmias from here on in? Okay, so we're going to start off by talking about the supraventricular arrhythmias, and then we will progress on to the ventricular arrhythmias. Okay, and we're just going to go through it in the order that I've written here. We're going to start off with the supraventricular arrhythmias that result because of problems with the sinoatrial node. Then we're going to talk about supraventricular arrhythmias that result because of problems with the atria. Then we'll go on to supraventricular arrhythmias that result because of problems with the AV node. Then we'll go on to, uh, well, we won't discuss those, then we'll go on to uh, problems uh, that arise in the ventricles to cause ventricular arrhythmias, and then finally we'll come back to these and a little bit of this, and we'll discuss AV nodal block and bundle branch block. I feel that block, uh, AV node block and bundle branch block is best left right till the end and talked about separately rather than trying to integrate it uh, into the categorization that I've talked about here, okay, because I feel that blocks should all be talked about as one thing, um, because it's all very similar, just occurring at different areas, rather than putting it separately into the different areas. So as I say, we'll go through the arrhythmias arising in the sinoatrial node, the arrhythmias arising in the atria, uh, the ventric uh, the arrhythmias arising in the AV node, arrhythmias arising in ventricles, then we'll talk about AV node, uh, dual block, and bundle branch block. 
And then finally, uh, what we will do is we'll classify all of the antiarrhythmic drugs uh, into the Vaughan Williams classification. Now, I plan on going through the different arrhythmias, and then after I've talked about an arrhythmia, I will also talk about the treatment for that arrhythmia, uh, whether it's drug intervention or some other procedural intervention. Um, but the way I will do it is I'll just talk about each drug as we come on to it, rather than actually putting it into its Vaughan Williams category. Now there is a categorization called the Vaughan Williams categorization for antiarrhythmic drugs. Uh, as I say, we will just talk about the drugs as we meet them, rather than initially talking about the Vaughan Williams classification and then uh, going on to meet the scenarios where uh, they're actually used. I think that's the best way of doing it, actually just meeting the drugs when they uh, come come along as a treatment for a certain type of arrhythmia, uh, but then right at the end I will go back and then put them into their Vaughan Williams classification. So we'll finish up with the Vaughan Williams classification of antiarrhythmic drugs. So overall, what I'm going to do from now on is go through loads of different types of arrhythmias, and we will logically uh, go through the different areas of the heart where they can arise. Um, and we'll talk about the treatment, whether drug therapy or procedural therapy. We'll talk about the mechanisms of the drugs as we meet them. Uh, we won't talk about their Vaughan Williams classification as we meet them. We'll do that right at the end. Once we've seen all their mechanisms and where they're used, we'll then put them into their Vaughan Williams classification. And then we'll finish the video. So, I'm going to have a break here, and in the next video we'll begin with arrhythmias arising in the sinoatrial node.